the text Beowulf itself begins in a very powerful way. It starts off with a, uh, a, a word that just kind of grabs you by the throat. Listen up. You know, pay attention. Look. Behold. Uh, ecce. Anshila domine. It's, it's a word which just immediately grabs your audience. You can imagine sitting around the campfire telling this story uh, and starting off with this bam, pow, here's the, here's the story. This, for instance, is a, is a good video that kind of captures that right here. But the text itself, Beowulf, here it is, is what it looks like. Which opens, uh, listen, behold. Sounds like this in, in Old English. Wait. Wigradena in Gerdagam, Theod Kinninger, Therimge Frunen, Rutha Erlinga, Selen Fremadon. And I'm going to link here to uh, somebody actually singing this in a dramatic way, which sounds very, very good. Uh, it's interesting to hear that the, the, the poem is grabbing you by the throat immediately and, and saying, listen, here's this great story. It is a great story. It's a story that really influences all of British literature. So without further ado, here's a connection to reading of this. Now the first thing I want to look at is that the poem opens with this history of the Danish people and this generation, Skjöld, for instance, and Beowulf, son of Skjöld, which is a different Beowulf, by the way. It's like Fred, son of John, and Fred, son of Michael. They're both named Fred, but they're two different Freds. Um, you have a history of the Danish people, and there is an example here at the very opening of Skjöld, and how Skjöld is the essence of what a king should be. And it says here in the very opening of the text, page one, Then at the fated hour Skjöld very brave passed hence into the Lord's protection. Then did they, his dear comrades, bear him out to the shore of the sea, as he himself had besought them. Whilst as friend of the Skjöldings loved lord of the land, he held sway long time with speech. There at the haven stood the ring proud ship radiant and ready the chieftain's vessel. And they laid down the loved lord, the bestower of rings on the bosom of the barge, the famous man by the mast. Many treasures and ornaments were there brought from afar. I never heard of a sightlier ship adorned with weapons of war and garments of battle swords and corslets. Many treasures lay on his bosom. They were to pass far with him in the power of the flood. No whit less did they furnish him with gifts, with great costly stores, and did those who sent him forth from the beginning, while he was still a child, alone, over the waves. Further, they set a golden banner high over his head. They let the ocean bear him, and surrendered him to the sea. Sad was their mind, mournful their mood. Men cannot tell for a truth. Counselors and all heroes under the heavens who received that burden. So what they're suggesting here at the very beginning is that Skjöld is sort of this example of what a good king is. And they say that he is, he's, he's, a, he's a good man, a good king, and the people loved him uh, throughout his country. And um, that is the example that is sort of set for what a good man should be. And we see at the very end of the poem, not to give away the story, we see at the very end of the poem that Beowulf also meets that same greatness. And because of that, there's a sort of closure to the story, much like in The Hobbit, where it comes back again to the Hobbit hole at the very end of the story, and you have a peaceful scene of, of eating and drinking with friends, which is what sort of began the story at the very beginning. A similar thing happens here. At the very end, beginning of the story, you've got the example of a good king, and how a good king dies. And you have, at the very end of the story, a good king, and the example of how a good king dies. And this raises something which the Anglo-Saxons were particularly famous for. In the article which we will look at by J.R.R. Tolkien, which is The Monsters and the Critics, he suggests that the thing the Anglo-Saxons brought to Western literature, to British literature, was the sense of how a good man faces death. Over and over again in their stories, they have the story of defeat, being defeated, and how a good man faces defeat, because what the Anglo-Saxons conceived 
was that you can be good while everything is going well, but that doesn't really prove that you're good. If you've got a full tummy and you've got all your health and you've got your friends around you, you can say noble things and you can do noble things, but it's only when they're put to the test that you really know whether you're noble, whether you're really good. And the good man is only known then, ultimately, when he's defeated, when he's ruined. How does he face defeat or ruin? And that's sort of what the story of Beowulf is about. How do you face imminent defeat, the, the fact that you know you're going to die? Well, one of the opening images here is the building of a mead hall, of Herod. And we read here during the time of uh, Hrothgar that this building of a hall was part of how you face defeat. It says here in part two, then good fortune in war was granted to Hrothgar, glory in battle, so that his kinsmen gladly obeyed him, and to the younger warriors grew to be a mighty band. It came into his mind, in Hrothgar's mind, that he would order men to make a hall building, a mighty mead dwelling, greater than ever the children of men had heard of, and therein that he should part among young and old all which God had given unto him, except the nation and the lives of men. Then I heard far and wide a work laid upon many a tribe throughout this world the task of adorning the place of assembly. Quickly it came to pass among men that it was perfect, the greatest of all dwellings. He whose word had wide sway gave it the name of Herod. He broke not his pledge. He bestowed bracelets and treasure at the banquet. The hall towered up, lofty and wide gabled. It endured the surges of battle, of hostile fire. The time was not yet come when the feud between son-in-law and father-in-law was fated to flare out after deadly hostility. So here's this great mead hall that Rothgar builds, and it's an example of what a good man can do in his lifetime. Herot, or high hole, Herot. The high hole that he builds is up on a hill, and it's gilded with, with shining gold that, that gleams in the sun. It's a magnificent work. It's all carved. And Men gather there uh, to, to converse with each other, to drink and to eat and to enjoy the fact that they're alive. And this mead hall, it says, has suffered uh, attacks and war. It's, it's stood up to sieges, so it's seen uh, all kinds of violence. But it's strong, it is beautiful, it is happy, there's joy there. And it is in some ways uh, a representation of what this world could be like with the help of good men, that this world could be a place of joy and happiness. Herald is, a, is like a, a, a small uh, version of the world. And that's why then when Grendel sees it, he wants to destroy it. The thing the text says that draws Grendel out of the swamp is the sound of merriment, the sound of feasting, the sound of happiness that's in Herald. And he wants to annihilate that. Why? Because he is the enemy. He is the, the evil. He is the destructive force. He's the dragon. Uh, he's the, the, the force of chaos that wants to devour all that's good and noble and light in the world. And uh, his name alone uh, means that. And I want to look just for a minute at the character of, of Grendel. The word Grendel means grinder, one who grinds and destroys, gnaws. And consequently, because of that, he has a, an affinity with the snake at the bottom of the world tree. Remember that the structure of the Anglo-Saxon world was a tree, a, a huge tree called Yggdrasil, at the top of which, in the boughs, was this world of ours, surrounded by water, uh, an island in the middle of water, and the sun and the moon and the stars transgress, the transverse across that sky. And it was a world of light and happiness and joy high up in the tree boughs. And down at the base were the evil creatures. And one of the great evil creatures was the dragon around the base of the tree. And it gnaws away at the roots of, of the tree. So that in the Anglo-Saxon world, there is this sense that eventually even this great tree and this great world will be devoured by that snake. He will eventually um, consume it. In a similar way, you have the grinder, Grendel, living out in the swamps and the marshes, the outcast areas, the, the realm of chaos that's outside of the civilized world. 
and he too desires to destroy this whole. And the author here even hints at the fact that that dragonish thing, that Grendelian thing, is also in the hearts of men. Because he points out here at the end on page 2, the hall towered up lofty and wide gabled and endured the surges of battle and of hostile fire. So this hall endures all this type of siege from outside forces, but the time was not yet come when the feud between son-in-law and father-in-law was fated to flare out after deadly hostility. He refers to something that happens way after our story. That is, that there is a feud between the son-in-law and father-in-law who eventually kill each other within the halls of Herald to burn Herald to the ground. And Herald is ruined by this destructive dragonish force in the hearts of men. But for our story, for now, we have Herald built as a city on a hill, a gorgeous place, a place of happiness and joy. And that place of happiness and joy then is the reason why Grendel comes to annihilate the whole.